This is my rifle. There are many like it, but this one is mine. My rifle is my best friend. It is my life. I must master it as I must master my life. Without me, my rifle is useless. Without my rifle, I am useless. I must fire my rifle true. I must shoot straighter than my enemy who is trying to kill me. I must shoot him before he shoots me. I will. Before God, I swear this creed. My rifle and myself are defenders of my country. We are the masters of our enemy. We are the saviors of my life. So be it, until there is no enemy. But peace. Amen. Welcome back, everybody, to the Film Bros Podcast. My name is Isaiah Lucas, and I am joined by my co-hosts. Abraham. And Nick. How y'all doing tonight? <laughs> Good. And, uh, as you can tell, I am pretty much quarantining right now, so... Yeah, we have this... This, uh, this, is, this is the view you've got of me right here. <laughs> yeah, we have this new state-of-the-art system. Um, yes. We ordered, like, this robot and all this stuff um, so. for Nick to be able to be with us doing the pod and everything you know live so yeah it, it's uh it's almost like i'm there with you guys right yeah yeah, yeah exactly you're still here you're still here <laughs> we make it work we make it work here at the film bro studio exactly but um yeah today we're um we're gonna be talking about nick's pick that he had um he picked um previous to the last episode which was the full metal jacket okay, yeah this movie came out in 1987 and was written by Gustav Hasford, who um, who wrote the original novel. Um, I believe the novel was called In Short Times. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. I believe so, yes. So he wrote the novel that this movie was based on and then also helped with the screenplay along with Michael H- Michael Hare. Is that correct? Michael Hare? I think so. I want to say her. I'm not sure. It's H-E-R-R. Okay. Yeah, Michael Her, I think. Michael Her. Sure. Okay. Uh, sorry if I butchered your name, Michael. <laughs> Um, so we got, yeah, Gustav Hasford, Michael Herr, and Stanley Kubrick, who all worked on the script for this one. And then Stanley Kubrick directed this one. Uh, this is one of Stanley Kubrick's films that um, people are very divisive on. People either love it yeah. or they don't love it. Um, so I'm excited that we picked this one, especially for the category of, like, war movie. Because mm. this isn't your typical war movie. No, not at all. Yeah. This is the second of the Stanley Kubrick films we've we've talked about, right? First one being uh, The Shining. Yes. So it's interesting to get to see more of his catalog, and and seeing this movie, you get to kind of see the the stuff he used that that, that like it's going in between films. You know what I mean? Like some of his style is showing through. Yeah, yeah. I think I think his style particularly shines through in this one with like the use of Steadicam and handheld, mm-hmm. and um, you know like perfect yeah. takes each each and every time like he's most definitely perfectionist which we'll get into in the facts for this one because it didn't just pertain to the shining him being a perfectionist it was also with this one so we'll we'll dive into that a little later though See. um but nick do you want to give us a little bit of a synopsis and then um we'll get into a spoiler warning and stuff and then dive into what we really loved about this movie yeah let's do it um so like we said spoilers a little bit later on but this movie basically follows a new recruits a platoon of new recruits going into basic training and uh going into the vietnam war that's kind of what they're what they're training for what they're focusing on and this film kind of focuses on you know what the war does to someone both physically and also mentally and we get to kind of see this platoon go through uh a world full of crap (laughs) and and how that affects each and every one of them individually and how they continue that on to the actual when the actual war comes not just through basic training so it was a really interesting take on 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 all that kind of stuff so what did you guys think yeah i so i remember watching this movie for the first time i think around the time that i was in college and i watched it on an illegal movie website i think Um, that's what we all did though yeah and and, (laughs) your mo now dude (laughs) yeah and it was like one of the it was one of those movies where i had heard of it i never watched it um i think my first exposure to this movie actually was like in maybe like fifth or sixth grade 
a, a kid had watched this movie previously and told me like all these funny lines from it, specifically from the drill instructor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was like my first exposure to the movie like ever. And, um, looking back on that, he that, that kid being our age should not have watched that. <laughs> <No way. laughs> oh, for real. No like, it's not a movie for like fifth graders or sixth graders to watch. It definitely has some very heavy subject matter and um, some pretty heavy themes as well throughout it. So it was pretty funny, like thinking about that now and being like, man, that kid was was on one. You yeah. know, so, <laughs> he changed, hopefully or, you know, he probably was. Yeah. But um, I I don't I, I enjoy this film for for what it is. I, I really enjoy the almost like critique of the military and kind of how they go about things and their methods. I guess you know there this, there's that saying you know there's a method to madness. Mm. Yeah. Um, and the the military definitely does have their methods to their madness, um, which I understand. And um, I it also kind of draws parallels to Whiplash for me. I was I, I had heard a, uh, a fact someone saying. You know, this would be whiplash if it was in war times. Yeah. 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 And it's essentially, you know, uh, a look at, you know, trying to shape up to the almost impossible standards of what it is to be a, a Marine, you know, mm-hmm. and um, to essentially, you know, put off your entire self and, and lose your identity and become like this killing machine. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I really, I really enjoyed that aspect of the film because, like I said, this isn't your typical war film. It's it's a film that's more or less, you know, looking at the the psycho, the psychological effects of war as well as the physical effects, and not necessarily showing you like all this like combat and stuff. Right? It shows yeah. you a little bit here and there, but that's not the main focus of the yeah. film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What did you I think, would, Gabe? This is a different movie. I want to say it's not like you said. It's not the typical war movie. It's not your um, action, go action, action, action movie. Like it's not jam packed with that. It's, I w- to me, I want to describe it like it's two different movies. Mm-hmm. Essentially, yeah. yeah. A lot of people that's feel that way criticism. too. Yeah, that's um, a, that's a pretty common criticism with this one. And that's what I felt with it. But I want to say like, I feel like the drone instructor. There's a lot of memes about him. Like they oh, yeah. they they made memes about him. So seeing this movie where this is my first time watching it, seeing the movie and seeing where the memes actually originated. And then just thinking of the memes, I'm like, bruh, that that has nothing to do with this movie. Like, like sometimes they they do, but they did like this has nothing. Um, and it's, I don't know, I, I'm mixed feelings about this movie. I don't know okay. if I really liked it. Okay, well we can dive more into that right now if you want. Or Nick, let let's hear what you thought about it. We didn't talk about that. Uh, so I have been. I mean, I've known this film often like I, I i remember being really young hearing about it and, and watching it and i remember always i always watch the first part of it like i'll go through the first half of just the, the di the drill instructor and all that craziness and then for some reason i would always taper off and not ever finish it so it was interesting to, to finish it and i was talking to abraham a little earlier it reminded me heavily of jarhead yeah mm, if you've okay. ever seen that it's 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 about a film where you know there's a lot of talk of action there's a lot of talk of being in the war and what that does to someone like mentally but there it's not so heavily emphasized with the action like you were saying Isaiah so it was an interesting take and I'm, I'm really excited to talk about it all right I've yet to see Jarhead so I own it so if you want to watch it the it's I was telling Jake Gyllenhaal movie. I w- yeah. yeah it's another Jake Gyllenhaal movie my favorite but I was actually talking with Isaiah maybe Jarhead took some inspiration from this movie since this movie oh, came back it definitely did because this jarhead came out afterwards yeah exactly so realizing it i'm like bruh yeah that's for sure yeah. some some resemblance like it's almost like two different movies for jarhead as well mm. yeah. okay well you'll definitely have to let me borrow it one day so that way i can check it out for myself yeah um but all right i mean let's get talking about this movie um so this is your spoiler warning if you haven't seen this movie go check it out it is streaming on hbo max right now so if you have yet to do so and you have hbo max do it it's a great movie um it's uh it's definitely a different kind of movie it's one of those um i think one of those stepping stones into kubrick as a director and as a filmmaker so if you you know are finding yourself wanting to dive into his category or his category his catalog a little bit i feel like this is a good movie to do so as well as like the shining Um, because a lot of his movies have to deal with you know psychological things and um you know people just going mad and going crazy so um 
I would definitely say check this one out. Uh, like we said, it's on HBO Max. And uh, if you don't care about spoilers, continue listening. If you do, cut it off here, go check it out, and then come back and hear what we have to say about it. So um, I guess we can start immediately with the, the you know, our, our favorite scenes. Yeah. So, Nick, yeah. do you want to start us off? I will, yeah. So, the of course, the favorite scene of mine is the introduction. Yeah, I really love the introduction here as well. I, I love it, dude. Yeah, I love the the juxtaposition of these guys getting their heads yeah. shaved with yeah. the that country song playing in the background. It's like something it says something something hello Vietnam or something yeah. like that. Or goodbye yeah. goodbye, goodbye USA <sighs> Hello Vietnam. Gosh, or something. Dang it. Yeah, something like that. I forget yeah. exactly. But I loved it. I like it yeah, because uh, you don't hear them talk. You just you don't get introduced to a certain character. You get introduced to everyone in that platoon and it's yeah. literally just them shaving their head. Mm-hmm. And getting I, I think they do that for a reason too, because the whole point of this mo- movie, like you were saying, as is the like the shedding of oneself and becoming more of like a unit. Yeah. And and getting them to see all you know being shaved as one, being you know uniformed up as one, and, and not having any names as one. Yeah. You kind of are already kind of destroying that idea. Yeah, they're they're stripping their identities from them. Yeah. So they're making like like we said all equal. They're yeah. everyone's getting the same buzz cut. Um, everyone gets the same uniform. Yeah. No one is referred to by their actual names. Yeah. Everyone gets a nickname. So it's like, yep. you know, everyone gets almost, uh, everyone gets their identities taken from them. And that's the, just the start of the dehumanization process that goes into the entire process of boot camp. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I really love that scene specifically just watching these guys. Like some of the expressions on their face, they just look like, they're like, like, what did I, what did I do? What did I sign up you know, for? What like, I, what am I going through right now? Yeah, you know, what the dude, that barber's just going at it. Just yeah, he's, he's taking going that hair ham. too, dude. I feel like that would hurt. Along, dude. I feel like that would hurt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it probably I does. It would, I thought it would. But yeah, I really enjoyed that scene too. Yeah, I even extend it more to where, like, basically the the drill instructor scene when he's uh, you know talking to them at the very beginning as well. Yeah, yeah, that's my that's my second favorite scene as well. Okay. I um I love like the whole sequence of us getting introduced to him, um and dude, I just have to say right off the bat, the 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 drill sergeant kills it. Yeah, um, his his name his actual name is R. Lee uh, Emery, I believe is how you say his name. Um, let me see, I have it I have it written down here exactly. Uh, yeah, R. Lee. Oh no, R. Lee Ermy, is how you mm. say it. Um, but yeah, he kills it in this movie with the dialogue that, um, that he goes through. I mean, it's top tier and, um, the, the comebacks and jokes that he cracks at these guys and all this stuff is just (laughs) on another level. Like so creative. Yeah. Like, (laughs) I don't know how anyone could like actually write it because it's just so insane to hear. And I, I was actually reading a couple of facts that, you know, most of his dialogue and everything is heavily ad libbed, um, (laughs) do yeah, due to this guy, um, Arlie Ermey, being he was r- truly a drill instructor and was was in the military for several years before mm. um, before I believe he got discharged medically. Oh, dang! And then oh, wow. um, went to school for uh, drama and some other major. Ended up being in a couple of sh- TV shows and films, um, and then he landed his big breakout role with Full Metal Jacket. I mean, just real quick, what a uh, role change, like being in the military to being an actor yeah how that's so bizarre well, it, it sounds kind of weird kind of right at home with this role right? yeah, yeah 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 i mean he's essentially doing what he did for a couple just of years being just being filmed yeah. yeah but yeah i mean it's kind of nice too that he had that experience because then i mean he knows what they did to him he had to go through it so now he's just portraying it on on film yeah I also he brought that authenticity that he needed, and I uh, watched some videos of, of people reacting to that. People who were in the military and, and went through boot camp and all like that, and they said oh, it was surprisingly accurate. Yeah, yeah, that's one like, thing that I had mentioned at the at the end of our last episode. My, my old coworker Jason has mentioned that this movie is like very real and very accurate in the depiction of boot camp and, and what yeah. goes on there. Um, I also really love, I lumped this whole scene in with like, uh, Joker making his war face and, <laughs> I, um, I and well. getting, getting introduced to private pile and all that stuff. Um, the Joker making his war face and everything is just hilarious to me. He's, it's, yeah. you know, just, he gets put in a situation where, um, 
you know, the sergeant um, comes up to him and is like, oh, like, are you a joker? You're a comedian from now on. You're private joker and all this stuff. And um, from there, he's like, you think, what did you join the military for? And he says to kill. And he's like, you're a killer, sir. And he says, sir, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. And he says, all right, if you're a killer, let me see your war face. And he just goes, sir. And he's all, let me see your war face. Ah, <laughs> that's a war face. Let me see your war face. <laughs> and homie just starts screaming at the top of his lungs. He's all, that's not a war face. Let me see your war face. And he just is screaming. And mm-hmm. um, it's hilarious. It's one of those things where you're just like, man, what the heck is going on? Like, yeah. <laughs> I would definitely be on private pile side, I think, like, not being able to take it seriously and laughing. Yeah, I was just about to say, do you guys think you can get handled getting yelled at by drill sergeant like that? I, I think at first, honestly, I would be in private pile of shoes. Like, I don't know if I would be able to take it serious at first until something dramatic happened. I think yeah. I would, I'd be like, no, like, I don't know. I'd be super hesitant to do anything. One, because real life, I mean, your life is about to change within the first hour you're there, I feel like. Mm-hmm. And then now I just... You got to listen to this person for the rest of the time you're there. Yeah. I don't know. It'd be kind of hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a, a big change of pace for, I mean, all of these people who were previously civilians, you know, however many days ago. Yeah. And now they are being turned into, like I said before, killing machines. They're being transformed into um, machines of war. So, yeah, I um, I really enjoy that entire scene. I also really enjoy getting introduced to Private Pile. Um just because I immediately feel bad for him. Yeah. Like I, I immediate, like he immediately gets picked on yeah. for being, you know, the bigger guy and, um, not being able to wipe that grin off his face. And, um, I, I do have to say, I do find it funny whenever he's like, wipe that grin off your face. He's like, sir, I'm trying, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so funny to me. Like I, I laugh at it every time because like I, I've been there. Like, how many times have you been in a classroom where, um, you know, you yeah, like you're cracking jokes with your friend or something like that, and then you're, you know, the teacher gets mad at you and tells you to stop. It only makes it funnier. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You and know? Because you, you and your friends are like, wherever you're just like. <laughs> yeah, for real. It's it's one of those things where, like, getting in trouble kind of makes it funnier and it yeah. makes it harder to contain yourself. So, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I feel like we've all been in those situations, but not necessarily this exact situation that Private Pile has been in. Um, I... I laugh, I laugh, and then I get really serious whenever he's like, get down on your knees and choke yourself. And he's like, what? And so, you know, he starts doing like the, the choke yourself, you know, thing. He's, he's all, he's all, put your hands down. That's not what I meant. Lean in and choke yourself. And he's like, what? And so he grabs his hand and he's all, that's not what I mean either. You're going to lean in and you're going to choke yourself. And he starts leaning in and that he drill goes, sergeant like, really starts choking him. Like yeah. he starts turning red. And just rips into him, and he's like, "If you think you're gonna make a fool of me and all this stuff, and, you know, just it's, rips him a new one." It's crazy because in that scene, he's still grinning for quite a while. Yeah, he's like, "Oh, I'm gonna, I, I can do this." And yeah. then eventually, he realized, like, "Oh crap, this is, I can, I can pass out potentially." Yeah. Yeah. And he finally just like <gasps> gasps for that air. Yeah, yeah. And then when, once he gets finally gets let go, that's where we see that you know this isn't a game yeah. anymore. This is real. This is what's happening. And um, you better get with the new normal. Yeah, you know, real so. quick. But yeah, that was my second favorite scene. You got a you got another one after that? Abe? Yeah, I do. It's a little bit. It's still during the first part. It's a little bit when so the drill instructor tells him, um, Pyle, that he is causing everyone to go behind. Um, and it's I'm not sure. I think it might be Joker, who is starting to run with him. Um, and he's like carrying him. And he's like carrying him. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that whole sequence because it shows um, the platoon finally coming into unity. Mm-hmm. Um, you become like one. You're one family. You're you guys are one together. Um, and I especially love the scene where Pyle falls down in that mud, and everybody is picking up each other. Like it, one one falls after the other, and they're all picking up each other. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, dude, heck yeah! Like finally it's showing Pyle some support, and everybody's like pitching in finally. Yeah. And I, I really liked it because um, as a civilian, for, for us, at least you're taught, like, the, the military, any form of military, your, your family. And seeing that, you really see what they're doing for each other. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know. I just really like that scene. Yeah. What about you, Nick? I uh, like that scene, too. And I extend it even to when he gets promoted because that's kind of whenever he starts that mentorship role. Um, 
you know, he, he gets asked a question about, like, do you believe in, in religion? And he says no. And he goes, I can't remember the exact quotation. I don't even, I'm not even sure if I want to quote it word for word because it's just some of the stuff coming out of this fool's mouth is crazy. <laughs> um, but he, he ends up saying, you know, you, oh, do you want to take that back? And he goes, no, if I take it back, I know I'll get punished even more. So they call, he calls Snowball over and he goes, Snowball, you're, you're fired. The new, uh, the new platoon squad leader is, is Joker now. And then we get to see Joker kind of take on this leadership role for uh, uh, Pyle. And mm. I don't know about you guys, but whenever he's sitting down and showing him how to make his bed and showing him how to clean his rifle and, you know, put his shoelaces on, it kind of made me feel, like, both comforted and also uncomfortable. Yeah, because he's having to do this for a grown adult. Yeah. Yeah, well, not only that, it's like the drill instructor has created this environment that's so hostile and so, like, motivated to be angry and anger is the thing that's going to teach these students or these these you know these recruits so to see him kind of be like nice and gentle i was like oh this feels like it shouldn't be happening you know what i mean like it's so against the drill instructor's mode of operation so yeah. it just made me feel I was like i was like oh this is so so different it also it kind of gives me vibes of like a like a good cop, bad cop, mm. you know, Definitely, yeah. like, you know, Joker is being the good cop and trying to reason with, with pile and get him to understand certain things. While whenever the drill instructor comes in, he's bad cop and is going to try to get things done his way. You know, the hard mm-hmm. way. Yeah. Yeah. I do get what you're saying though, Nick, when it makes you feel uncomfortable because it, at that point seeing pile, um, basically being babied essentially, um, made me question, should he even be in the military? Yeah, and yeah. further on in the movie, we find we find out something, but it's just it just that's where I start to question. I'm like, dude, what are you doing in the military? Yeah, like I don't think you're fit for it. Like, no offense, to you mm-hmm. like it's not just your your weight or anything. It's just mentally. Yeah, you got to yeah, be super prepared for that. For, and for the military, my, I mean, I just started questioning it, and I was like, dude, what are you doing? Yeah, it's just so I get what you're saying when it feels uncomfortable. Yeah, I even like this scene too because you know you get that camaraderie between the two and you get to see like it's a very common human response to to fit to sympathize for this guy and to help him along his way but when he continues to fall and to struggle and not only you know damage himself but damage his platoon as well like you get to see the platoon start to like not not put up with it anymore you know they're the ones that are getting damaged for his shortcomings yeah so to get to see them kind of like you know like overcoming that and and then like taking it out on pile yeah i think was rewarding and i think also realistic Hmm. yeah yeah i that kind of leads into my next favorite scene but i do want to talk about um just kind of how like childlike pile is exactly in, in, in a moment like like well not in a moment you know throughout the entire film he's he's pretty childlike and it's like um it's like joker kind of almost takes this like like motherly or you know fatherly type role this parental type role to take care of yeah. Pyle because like he almost can't do it for himself yeah. um like it's even um after this scene um after the my favorite scene like he's straight up buttoning him up like yeah. buttoning his shirt up and he's like tucking your pants you know no one hates you and all that stuff everyone's just tired of you messing up you know everyone's tired of your mistakes yeah. and um it's at that point further you know onward that you know Pyle starts to find things that he's good at in the military and starts to brush things up and and starts to become uh, the thing that the drill instructor wanted from everyone that goes through boot camp, you know? Um, But let me talk about my favorite scene real quick. It's unfortunately after the jelly donut scene. I love the Um, jelly donut scene. Yeah, dude, that, that scene is, it's, it's hilarious, but it's also like such a bro moment for me. Like I have it written down in my bro moments because Putting, put yourself in the shoes of Private Pile. Like, yeah. you know, something as, as you know, as innocent, like, and childlike almost, like stealing a donut and, you know, keeping it for yourself. He gets caught with it. And then eventually is like, okay, I, can, I obviously can't get too, like, through to you, like, through the way that I'm doing it. So if that's not going to work, then I'm going to punish everybody here. And then you go ahead and enjoy your donut. Yeah, every like, time every time you mess up, I'm punishing everybody else, but not you. Yeah, and that's just that's gotta feel bad. Yeah, you know, oh, to yeah. to be in pile of shoes and to you know see everyone else suffer at your hand has gotta feel you know crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, I yeah, I just immediately feel bad for him. Um, whenever he you know they wake up the next morning, he says everyone hates me. I need help, you know, and um, 
that that immediately pulls into question like you know, is is everything okay with this guy yeah you know like mm-hmm. is he truly fit to be in the military um but yeah let me go ahead and talk about my favorite scene it's whenever um you know all this stuff has been happening i, I think after that they're doing um burpees and he uh private pile sitting up on that big <laughs> thing and he's sucking no, his, he's thumb, his thumb dude you know and um it's after that we get to the scene where everyone in the barracks um starts to beat dude. private pile and this is a this is a scene that um i don't know it's kind of hard to watch like for me it was it's it feels almost a little too it feels too real like it it feels very you know candid and brutal and um it's a little hard to watch man because it just you just see like swarms of people just coming with these blankets with a bar of soap in it and they're just whacking on pile like everyone gets a turn like and there's like what 30 plus people in that (laughs) barrack dude he's just getting hit you know and it it's hard to watch yeah. But um, but I, I I also love that scene for, like the eeriness that gets brought in. Like I was gonna take a second to highlight the the music that goes on there. Yeah, like it's it's so sinister sounding. Like it's so ominous, dude. Yeah, and I I love the music that gets brought in. I also love like the the shot during nighttime, like all these blue shades and it's dark and you know you you can tell that only moonlight is being used as the mm. light source. Uh, yeah. It's very beautiful in that aspect, but you know it's also funny kind of like juxtaposing you know beautiful imagery with this like super ominous music and then someone just straight up getting bullied and and beat yeah you know um i feel so bad for pile whenever it's happening to him and you know it's got to be frustrating for everyone else though having to like pay for someone else's mistakes and so Mm -hmm. you feel like at that point that's the only way you're going to get through to him is like okay if you continue to do this we're going to continue to beat you up yeah you know but um, at the end of it, it makes me feel so bad for him whenever he starts saying "ow," because it it emphasizes that childlike state. Like you know, whenever a kid gets hurt, what do they immediately say? "Ow." Exactly, and he yeah. starts you know clutching himself and just keeps saying "ow, ow, ow." Like it, it feels like you know, a kid got hurt. Like, yeah. Like someone who's not in their right mind has been hurt. And I mean, it even, it even translates onto Joker's face whenever he starts to cover up his ears and like, doesn't want to hear it anymore. Like he, he can tell what happened was wrong Yeah. and he doesn't want to deal with the consequences. Well, so, am I correct in assuming that Joker participated, right? Yeah. He, yeah. And he, he, he hesitates at first too. Like he, he hesitates. Does. He with, goes, dude, you have to do it. You have to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's that, what he, he wallops on him like five times. Yeah. He does it more than anyone. Yeah. But you can, you can tell that he really... You did know, it doesn't want to. want to do it like he still has that he that still has yeah him. he has that humanity still yeah he, he's essentially like almost the only one in that barrack who still has their humanity mm-hmm. besides pile yeah but it's after that night that you know <laughs> even pile starts to get his humanity stripped away from him and becomes mm-hmm. what the drill instructor wanted a killer here yeah. yeah he becomes you know the killing machine that the military wants um, which we'll get into a little later. But. Yeah. It also blew my mind that one of the uh, um, recruits eventually tells Pyle, like, remember, it was just a bad dream. Like, Yeah, like being uh, like, hey, this didn't happen. Like, how how are you supposed to even go about that after? Like, You, you can't, honestly. Or, that's what I'm saying. It's just, it's just hard. It's hard to see. I get, I get what you're saying when it's hard to see. Yeah. Especially since it brought up my question like is he fit for that yeah. so yeah you got another favorite scene Abe? uh my next favorite scene is not until a little bit after in the movie so i'd probably skip me okay what do you think my about? next favorite scene actually is like the culmination of this first half of the movie it's when uh you know joker gets pulled for Firewatch. he's got to walk around at night make sure everyone's in their place he notices that uh Pile's not in his bed. He goes to the the head or the bathroom, and that's when we get to see Pile sitting on the toilet, you know, with his gun, caressing it, saying all these weird things about it, loading it up, and he's like, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? And, you know, he gets up, he says, you know, I am in a world of crap right now, Mm -hmm. and he starts to do his, like, gun salute, where he's like, right, right arm, and he puts it up. Yeah. He's going crazy, and that ends up waking up everybody yeah and he starts doing the whole this is my rifle there are many like it but this one is mine yeah Yeah. dude immediately also real quick hearing that immediately i thought of jarhead 
Did oh, they really? say that? Yeah, it's a thing that is used in the military, I believe. I know. Like, yeah. uh, but go ahead. But, sorry. Um, you know, the, the drill instructor comes in and he's like, what is going on here in my head? Why are you two out of bed? Why does he have a weapon? And Joker is like, you know, as a private, I, uh, you know, I, I need to tell you that he has a rifle and it's fully loaded. <laughs> yeah. And he immediately, like, it's still stone cold. He, he looks at me and he starts to antagonize him even more. He goes, you know, did your mommy and daddy not give you enough attention as you were a kid? And then that's when we see pile pull up the gun and just unload yep how did you guys uh, feel ab this was your first time seeing that how yeah, how did you feel about that scene? i i watched it and said bro what the heck actually th- those weren't my exact words but i <laughs> <laughs> i that i was not expecting that because i mean i expected the drill sergeant to go even further on in the movie not even seeing him die yeah um yeah. and immediately i i that like solidified my assumption of pile like dude he's not fit to be here mm-hmm. like why the heck did he join if he if he knew that he probably couldn't handle it then why and then right after that we get that scene where he eventually turns on himself mm-hmm. yeah. and commits suicide like yeah they do not shy away from showing that either. no not at all no it's pretty real to look and, into and i actually turned away um when i heard the shot yeah. Because I was like, bro, no way. Like, it just also shows that you have to be mentally prepared for the, for the military. Yeah. Like, if you have some, some something you're dealing with, like, don't go to the military with that. Well, I also think this scene, like, and, you know, the, the entire movie up until this point is, like, a big critique on the military in that, like, kind of showing how pointless war is. Mm. Like, we're just you know, we're brainwashing almost and, and breaking down these these guys who have identities and have, you know, they have, you know, certain things about them that make them who they are. And now we're stripping them of all of that and making them into these, you know, monsters almost, or like, yeah. you know, these, these war machines. And, yeah. um, you know, we're, we're, you know, stripping everyone from their humanity and, and making them something that they didn't originally want to be. Um, and and when we see that like in Pyle's face, like I I he makes these certain looks like almost like monster like, um, in that bathroom scene, um, and he just looks out of his mind and yeah. you know is talking about the type of ammo he has. He says that the rounds are full metal jacket, which means they're more dangerous, and you know goes to start doing his little this is my rifle thing, and um. I mean, at this point, like, yeah, he's he's completely dehumanized. He's become what the drill the drill instructor wanted, and um, you know, eventually turns on the teacher that right, like, and and kills the teacher in the process. Yeah. Um, and I also think this this will go uh, hint on a little later into the movie, but watching Private Pyle and seeing how you know the the you know unfortunate direction that his character took and in, in, yeah. in taking his own life. Um, had he continued on with the military, I think he would have went on to be a, like a character like Animal Mother later whenever we get the Vietnam scenes. Like when we when we get into Vietnam and we get introduced to the character Animal Mother, he is like the ultimate Marine, mm-hmm. right? He has no fear. He kills on sight, just blasts everything, no question. And, you know, is he is exactly what the drill instructors designed to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the ultimate Marine. Um, I feel like if we had watched Pyle go down that go down that path, he would have eventually, you know, taken the same road as as Animal Mother, and you know, went down that same path and become One quote the unquote the ultimate Marine. Yeah, person with no sympathy, empathy, nothing. Yeah, exactly. I really like how they add in those scenes too of um, the the drill instructor like glor like glorifying those. Um, those uh, killers, uh, Lee Harvey yeah. Oswald and I forget the other guy, but you know they were previously Marines. That's where they learned how to shoot. That's where they learned to become killing, mar- you know, killing machines. And the the drill instructor is almost praising that. But like yeah. these people have straight up killed Famous civilians. Yeah. Like they've killed civilians. It's not like you know, in, in under the guise of war. It's mm-hmm. these guys are full cold blooded killers. Yeah. And guess what? They were Marines. So 
I guess that means like we're good at our job, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like the, yeah, I just like how they added that in and like how the drill instructor is almost like taking pride in that. It's very weird, but uh, effective nonetheless. Yeah. But um, yeah, that was one of my favorite scenes as well. Um, my next favorite scenes don't get into, um, don't, don't happen until we get into Vietnam. Yeah, my, my next my scene is in Vietnam as well. Okay, you want to take the first one? Yeah, so it's actually right when we get into Vietnam when you see Joker and somebody else sitting at the corner of a street. Yeah, I, man, I forget his name. It's like Rudder. I'm not sure. He's oh another film God. photographer. Yeah, they work in journalism together. Yes, yes. So, eventually, so essentially they're just there in Vietnam now, close to the base. Mm-hmm. Um, and I... And I probably didn't like it because it's, it's super funny. The scene is super funny to me. But it's this girl, essentially, I want to say she's a hooker. Um, she's walking down the street and being super provocative. I can't even say. <laughs> provocative. <laughs> provocative. And she's, like, telling these guys, like, oh, this much will get you this, this, and this. And what made this scene for me was this random guy steals the camera from the other guy. That was the Joker. It's a rafterman. A rafterman. <laughs> And yeah, it's yeah, he Rashman. starts doing and do, starts doing some like karate moves, and Rashman Man does it back to him, and the guy just gets on his moped and leaves. And I was like, "What is this? Like, you're just gonna not do anything? Like, he just stole your camera? Yeah. And you're yeah. just gonna? She's playing it off as it's funny. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I just really appreciate appreciate it because after we just left this heavy scene, we get introduced to that, and yeah. then I was like, "Bro, that's just funny." Yeah, yeah, and it, it's one of those things where it's like. It's world building, right? We recognize we're in a foreign place. Um, things that, you know, wouldn't normally happen in the U.S. are happening here. And, you know, we see, you know, there's a ton of traffic, different looking cars. This woman comes up, you know, t- starts talking about things that would not be allowed in the U.S. or are at least not legal. And, um, you know, that's that's where we get those those famous lines. Yeah. Um, I mean, they've even been like sampled in songs. I think of like a mm-hmm. song from two live crew that the song, you know, that line has been used as a sample in the song. Um, and yeah, it, it, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's Ugh. sort of like become iconic and I don't know why, like it's, <laughs> it's like not meant to be, you know, but, but, it, it, but it did, it, un, you know, somehow became iconic in that way, which mm-hmm. is, kind of funny but also kind of like disappointing in yeah a way. <laughs> but um yeah that's that's a pretty good scene i um yep. my next one doesn't get into uh it doesn't happen until we get into the city of way and it's the whole bird is the word scene i that scene i was so confused i i liked it um <laughs> do you have anything before that nick no no that's yeah it's pretty much where mine ends up too Okay. All right. So the bird is the word scene. I really enjoy just because it's this single scrolling shot of this like war footage. Like there is chaos and destruction and, you know, all of this stuff just happening juxtaposed with Yeah. And it's like, uh, I don't know. It's one of those things where we're just like, what the heck is going on? Exactly. Like, how am I, how am I supposed to make sense of this? And, um, I, I kind of like started to pay attention to the the song and the way that they use the song and saying like don't you know about the bird everybody knows about the bird and I started thinking like okay what if they use this song as a symbol of like the bird being the US mm. right the military like everybody knows about the US being in Vietnam and all this stuff and you know um, if you don't you're about to find out essentially yeah. and um, I just also just love this juxtaposition of this like pop song that like everyone would be you know dancing to and having a great time with you know had it be played in in the correct context but stanley kubrick subverts our expectations with that and shows us like you know war with it and 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 it's one of those things where it kind of it unsettles you a little bit it makes you feel weird it doesn't let you know how to feel about it because you know had you changed the song in that scene it would have been a very different tone yeah for sure but you know because it's used with this song it's left you with this weird feeling of like am i like, supposed to laugh yeah, what am the I heck is going to... on like yeah is this supposed to be funny is this supposed to yeah. be like serious I and that's why exactly. i said i was confused because i was just like i mean you again you think about a war movie you're thinking about action you don't think about 
a funny song that's going to go with action. Like, what about Creedence Clearwater Revival, man? That's, yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Or Fortunate Son. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and it's just so confusing. And I didn't write it down, but that's that's the scene when the t- the person blows up, right? Is that around there? Yeah. Um, I think the when they're going into the city behind the tank. Yeah. That's before. That's before? Yes. Okay. See, and that's what I'm saying. Again, you see that's this. That's when they're like commanding officer like dies. Yeah, yeah. The sergeant or so, lieutenant, I yeah. think it was. But you see something like that happen and then it goes to this. Like, what the heck is that? Yeah. Yeah. It, and it, it's one of those things where, you know, it's a juxtaposition, right? Showing, you know, these two complete opposites of, you know, what we would correlate with one another and mashing mm-hmm. them together, giving us this feeling of like, what the heck is going on, yeah. you know? And I, I really enjoyed that. But um, yeah. my next one, my next favorite scene after that is the interview scenes. Um, because I believe that takes place right after because, you know, this crew is straight up filming all of these soldiers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And while all this, you know, gunfire and explosions are all happening behind them and that song is playing. And then they start to interview all these guys and start asking pretty heavy questions. Like, do you think America should be involved in Vietnam? why are you here? Like, and all this stuff. And we get everyone's reasons as to why they're here or at least why they believe that they're there. Yeah. Um, and I really enjoyed the way that they film it too. Like they make us look like, like we're watching them be interviewed. Like we see the mic in the shot. And it's almost like we're the camera, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's like the, the audience, the, the actors are talking to the audience. Yeah. Um, and it, it makes for like a pretty personal couple of scenes because there are certain guys that, have no idea why they're there like they honestly are just like yeah i'm just here because you know we're fighting for freedom and you know vietnam they don't you know they don't have any freedom we're trying to give these people our freedom and obviously they're not thankful you know we're dying for them and all this stuff and you know everyone there has all the wrong reasons for being there yeah and um i just i love that you can tell that nobody knows what they're doing (laughs) <laughs> and like, like everyone is there and they just don't know what's going on. And they're like, yeah, it's, everyone has a different reason. There's no collective, you know, creative thought as to why they're there. No one has a clue what's going on. I'm trying to think yeah. what, um, the, like the OG, the best, uh, Marine said, cause he said something funny while the camera showed up on him. I forget exactly. I forget what he says, but it was funny and it makes me. You say everybody's there for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, And whatever he said made me chuckle a little bit because I was like, (laughs) you're obviously not there for the right reasons. Yeah. So I'm trying to think. I'm going to look it up quick. So is is, uh, the, like, the reconnection with Cowboy and Joker, is that after this? That's before. No, no, that's before. Um, Okay, that is before. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, because he gets gets reunited with Cowboy in, like, that little village. He uh, does, That little, you know villa type thing and we meet cowboy and all the new characters like eight ball and animal mother and you know all those other guys okay but yeah yeah so do you want to actually talk about the actual fighting scenes when they're you know advancing on that that town Uh, yeah we could break them down a little bit they're not necessarily in my favorite scenes but let's we could break them down i i I don't know I, i i'm mainly thinking of the scene where um cowboy has to take over and he's talking to eight ball and he realizes that, that they're on the wrong path that and, scene you know, makes me mad to go forward to go forward and to, to basically scout ahead see if it's clear to go yep and this is where we get introduced to this sniper character yes and you know he gets shot two or three times and you know everyone's just riled up just completely unloading their bullets on just absolutely anything that moves yeah um I, I don't know. I loved it. I like seeing the, the reactionary, uh, like, you know, the reaction that they had of, of them just being like, oh, our buddy got shot. It's time to spray it. Like, yeah. <laughs> literally shoot any, rockets. Any structure to it. It's just. <sighs> yeah. I get what you're saying, too. But I want I I think it's um, Joker who says, like, no, we're not going to go rush them because we don't know what a sniper is. Mm-hmm. And yeah. essentially, I think it's true. Like, there's nothing you can do. Like, eight balls dead. Yeah. What What are you gonna do to save him? Yeah. Yeah. Like, Unfor- it's an unfortunate. Uh, it's an unfortunate situation where you know, you have friends that are not gonna come back with you, right? Exactly, yeah. and they and they're taught that. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. they're taught that like not everybody's gonna make it back to the u.s yeah and yeah. when everybody was like oh let's just rush let's just go 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 i'm like my my mind is like you don't know what you're gonna walk into yeah yeah like i ask myself that same question when i play warzone <laughs> 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 no but it's just like he has a point like why are we gonna go let's just wait until the tanks get here they can take care of it and then we can go yeah and then we even find out that like oh yeah we can't send any tanks can't spare any you're gonna have to find a way out on your own it's like all right great well now we're <laughs> now we're up crap creek you yeah. know like yeah we're halfway there right and yeah. you know another guy is like okay well you know what i'll go out there and and drag him back and, and we'll, we'll save him and he gets shot and you know it they're doing it uh the sniper's doing it in a, in a way that like to try to like bait the people out there so that way they you know, they can take one by one yeah and um i it also just drives on this whole like um back and forth between the 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 little platoon that they have is they they just don't know what's going on like they have no idea they're shooting at buildings that the sniper is not even in like you can tell like whenever we see shots from the sniper's perspective like they're behind all the buildings that they are shooting at yeah yeah and like i don't know it kind of gave me the same energy as a uh, that episode from the office and the fire drill you know Where everyone's just running with their like like cut Every, off yeah everyone's like running with like chickens like they're running like chickens with their heads cut off and yeah. it even reminds me like when handy um he hears the firecrackers and he's just like the fire is shooting at us <laughs> like like it's like Completely everyone reasonable kind of yeah like everyone is just going like knows doesn't know what's going on they have no clue how to react they lost their training it. yeah and, and they don't know how to react to the situation yeah um and um I, I don't know i just i really liked how they gave us these like little slivers of humanity in these guys like they recognize like you know i don't know what to do like i have no idea how to how yeah. to figure out this situation um it was also like i i love that they show that but then it's equally frustrating because it's like you guys like you went come through on. like come on you went through all this training and you can't do anything you know like so yeah i get and again going back to saving eight ball it's just like i get what they're they're human they want to that's their brother they're taught that this is a family and they're taught that like you don't leave a man behind mm-hmm. but then like the human part of you should be like no, I don't need I, to save myself. Yeah, like <laughs> I, I, I gotta go back home. Yeah, so it's just, ugh, I get it because I, I, I think when all this chaos comes to them, they lose what they were taught. Mm-hmm. They, it, and there's no, there's no sense of direction because they lost the lieutenant and then the one under that, and then it goes to Joker who has no, um, no a cowboy, cowboy. Yeah, who yeah, has well, no sense saying, of direction. I, that's why I really appreciate Animal Mother's characters because. He is that kind of person that can hold himself well under pressure in gunfight, you know. So him being the one to be like, okay, now I'm going to go. I'm not going to leave them behind. And him kind of, you know, have the mental fortitude to look at them and ask him, literally ask him, you know, where the sniper was. And it's one of my favorite scenes where he, like, he does his best to point and then they, to get shot up. And he looks. And then that's when he kind of unloads on the building and is able to, to bring the platoon forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that, I, I liked his character, and I feel like it was realistic for him to be the one to, to advance the team. Yeah, most definitely. I, I really enjoyed the scene, too, whenever um, they actually make their way over to where the sniper is at. Mm-hmm. And, um, man, it's such a bro moment whenever um, whenever they finally get over to that area. And they're, like, standing on this wall with all these holes. And I know, it's like, I think they're invincible right there. I was like, this guy's yeah, ridiculous. The, literally the entire time i'm like dude you guys got to crouch like your heads are popping out like he could see you this guy this the sniper can see you from where you're at and um of course cowboy goes over to the guy with the radio and starts to try to call in um some backup and gets shot and eventually dies and it, it's it's a pretty like harrowing scene whenever he's dying because they try to save him yeah they try to save him and and He's like trying to say like, oh, you know, I can take it, I can hack it, I can hack it, and yeah. um, is trying to, you know, say that he's okay, he's fine. When in reality, he's not. He he knows he's dying, and um, he he dies in Joker's arms, and you know, Joker has a bit of a rough time with that, and is just like, man, I just watched this guy I went through um, boot camp with 
die in my arms. Yeah. Like I, I've only witnessed death up until this point. Like there's nothing else that war brings. And, um, I also really love the scene whenever they finally, you know, go into where the sniper is at. And previous to this, they had thought like, oh, there's probably a whole, uh, you know, encampment in there or something like there's probably, you know, tons of guys in there just ready, like ready for us to, to walk out and just murder us. But it's literally just one teenage girl. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that kind of breaks my heart too, because, you know, war is not, a bunch of you know 30 year old men ready for action like it's it's typically portrayed especially in a foreign country like this where you know they just get as whoever can shoot a gun well like to be a part of the the militia so when you get to see and it kind of breaks my heart too and it's a little bit of what you're talking about ab of you know when being put under pressure they lose their their teaching is you know he's he's about to shoot her and he clicks and he's like he, he forgot to reload yeah and at that moment he hides behind that concrete wall and it's straight up like he straight up throws his gun yeah like like a like a scared little child and it was uh it was really heartbreaking to see them being put into a situation like that yeah yeah that's definitely a bro moment for me too whenever his gun clicks and then when we ultimately find out that the sniper was just a kid yeah you know, like it's it's one of those things where you're just like man like they you know they had this thought that like you know this is probably some some crazy like soldier who you know has you know however many plus kills you know yeah. has no like emotion whatsoever he's a stone cold guy you yeah. know and it's just a a girl like it's just a, a teenage kid who got put in a position that they had to try to defend what was theirs you know and um, I don't know. It's really sad to to see her, you know, be killed. And um, it's um, it's it's also really hard to watch. Like whenever they all surround her, and they're just like, "I got her! I got her!" Yeah, you know. And it's like, you know, had the roles been reversed or something like that, you know? Imagine seeing. Imagine like that being an American girl. Yeah. And like, yeah, you that's... know, everyone would be just living, lo- losing their minds. Yeah. yeah. 100%. And all that stuff, you know, and it's just. Well, then, just hard. imagine if it was them, because say it was them with all their enemies around them, and she's literally saying, "Just shoot me," because she doesn't want to be yeah, there. Yeah, she doesn't want to be in pain anymore, and which is super disturbing as well. Yeah, like she's just going, "Shoot me." Yeah, yeah. Shoot me. And and those shoulders, I don't, I can't even speak, dude. <laughs> the soldiers, <laughs> the soldiers. Are just like, oh, I think she's praying. Oh, I think she's doing this. I'm like, dude, no. Like, she's obviously like, that's when the human part should come back in them and be like, realize, yeah, like, look, like she's down. Maybe we could help her, mm-hmm. and then, like, just she can help us. Like, I don't know. Yeah, and that and that's where we see that Joker is the only one that still has a conscience. He still has that humanity intact. Um, it wasn't fully broken in boot camp. Um, Whereas, like, with a guy like Animal Mother, he's just like, effer. Yeah. Killer. Yeah. Like, oh, you're, oh, and, then, and then he gets into Joker's head and it's like, oh, you're such, like, a hard killer. 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 Yeah. Like, killer he on the spot it. right now. And he struggles with it. Yep, most he definitely. Does. He does struggle with it. He struggles hard and then eventually, like, executes her. Like, yeah. Execution style. And I, 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 I enjoy that aspect after whenever he, you know, finally does shoot this woman, uh, this, this girl, I should say. Um, you know, he just kind of stares and kind of just puts together what he actually did. Like, mm-hmm. because that was his first kill. Yeah. His first kill yeah. was a teenage, a teenage girl. A teenaged girl. And, and these, even, even in, uh, in, in scenes before, like that guy killing those rice farmers, he was like, just mowing, mowing them down, mowing down civilians. And, you know, Joker asks him like, how can you kill women and children? And he's like, Oh, like, the Viet Cong, they don't, you know, yeah. you know, they, you know, the only ones that are hiding are the ones that are about to shoot you. And the ones that aren't hiding, they're plotting on shooting you. So might as well just kill them all. You know, yeah. like it's just insane. Like the casual, you know, racism and hatred for these people that yeah. they're trying to save or, you know, un- you're supposed to be saving. It's yeah. yeah. Wild. And it blows my mind with the fellow fellow people tell Joker was like, Oh, now you're going to get the medal of honor for, doing this and this and i'm like how how can you celebrate that yeah i don't know 
it's 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 pretty i don't know it puts you in a weird position of like you know this is this is what war is and it's a hard thing to talk about sometimes like it's not it's not all glory uh, yeah. There, there are some some very harrowing things that come with war. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I also really want to talk about how uh, jo- I want to talk about Joker's stare. Um, there's a previous scene in the movie where one of the military guys that he's talking to on their base talks about having the thousand yard stare, yeah. and says that like you know you earn the thousand yard stare once you've been in the crap for a while. And I've been in there for a while, so I know I got it. You know, I know a couple of guys that got the thousand yard stare, and. And that in that moment, whenever he does finally take that girl's life, he he gets that thousand yard stare, and kind of has to come to terms with what he just did, and how he's going to live with himself after doing that. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Um, my last favorite scene is the ending, um, just because it's another one of those scenes where it, it has juxtaposition, and um, I also just I love that shot of the buildings on fire and then the soldiers silhouettes being painted against those like buildings on fire and mm-hmm. these guys are straight up marching to the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse theme song mm-hmm. singing M I C K E Y M O U S E and you know doing all this stuff and we get like a voiceover from Joker you know stating that you know he eventually you know dreamed of going back to to America and all that stuff and getting out but um. I, I want to talk about the use of the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse theme song um, and just the juxtaposition that it uses between that and, you know, the burning buildings and these soldiers that are essentially celebrating them killing that little girl. Yeah. Like <laughs> death. They're celebrating death. Yeah. And um, I I don't know. It's just interesting. The use of the them singing that song, um, you know, these these guys who are trained killing machines singing a children's song you know like it, it just drives home that that um that juxtaposition or that irony um that you know all innocence is lost mm-hmm. you know once you've been in war or have gone through war yeah. um you know there's no innocence left once you've you know been in that situation or taken a life yeah. and you know it juxtaposing that with an innocent child song you know that is is ironic but you know pretty harrowing at the end of it but yeah but that's it that's about it for my favorite scenes y'all you guys got any more nope i think no that's that's it it. for me as well okay perfect well let's get into some best quotes this is going to be a hard one because i feel like there are a lot of best quotes from uh the drill instructor but he is very vulgar yeah so (laughs) so we'll leave we'll leave some of the quotes for you guys to discover on your own if you know them or if you don't know them Go look them up for yourself. Yeah, we'll talk. Yeah. We'll talk about a couple here, but um, yeah, you guys want to start us off with some some best quotes? I only have one, and it's from Private Joker, and it's kind of like a sad one, and it's it says the dead know only one thing, and it's better to be alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have that one written down as well. Because it's true. I mean, once you're dead, it's better being alive. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah, like you said, it's one of those. You know, solemn quotes. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to hear, but it's true to say, I guess. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Um, my last quote, I only put down two, um, is from uh, the drill instructor, and he says, "The deadliest weapon in the world is a marine and his rifle. It is your killer instinct which must be harnessed if you expect to survive in combat. Your rifle is only a tool. It is a hard heart that kills." Hmm. If your killer instincts are not clean and strong, you will hesitate at the moment of truth. You will not kill. You will become dead Marines, and then you will be in a world of crap because Marines are not allowed to die without permission. Do you maggots understand? Make, obviously, you know, give them the sir, yes, sir. Uh, but I really loved that highlight of your rifle is only a tool. It's a hard heart that kills. And yeah. that's um, more true than ever. Yeah, um, but- you You have to be able to you know, really change who you are on the inside to be able to take a life versus, you know, just being able to pull the trigger. Like, it, it's not that easy. Essentially, you, know? you just got to, like, have a stone for your heart. Yeah. Um, And put your feelings aside, put everything that you believed in aside what you were taught. Because, I mean, growing up, you're taught that, like, killing is bad. Mm-hmm. Um, hurting someone is bad. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. when you get here, you're like, 
Joke's on you. Like, okay, maybe it's not bad. It's not bad. Like, if you're doing it for, for your country, it's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad in certain contexts. Yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, you know, so, that doesn't make sense. So but. <laughs> yeah, I get what you're saying. It's, you essentially just got to flip the script on your heart and be like, haha, that's not true. Yeah. 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 You got any quotes, Nick? The only best quote I had, other than the one you guys have said, is... Uh, uh, it's at a scene where they're talking it's i think it's during the interview scenes I, I can't remember who exactly speaks it but one person says and either he's talking about the the vietnamese people that are there that aren't fighting back he says they'd rather be alive than free i guess mm. and for some reason that really stuck out to me i was like Phew. it kind of hit hit a little harder than i realized yeah yeah that's a good one mm-hmm. it's a really good one um, well, if that's it for the best quotes, let's get into some bra moments. I feel like this movie is littered with bra moments. Yes. Um, my first one is whenever Private Pyle gets slapped around by the drill sergeant. Um, and that scene specifically reminded me of Whiplash. You know, the scene in Whiplash where he's, you know, start counting. Boom, slapping him. Uh, now, am I rushing or dragging? You know that whole scene? Yes, 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 yes. Um, this scene reminded me a lot of that in the in the effect that, like, had I been slapped around like Private Pile, I would I would have wanted to fight. Oh, I would have I would have wanted to post up. Yeah, yeah. Like, 100%. I I don't know if I'd be able to like take that, especially from you know an older guy. Like I'd be like, dude, I'll I'll fight you. I'll mess yeah. you up. You know. Well, even like now we mess around us three and we're like barely tapping each other. I'm like, all right, post up. Like <laughs> like the littlest things like that ag- aggravate me. So I can just imagine if I'm going in into the military and they're already like beating the crap out of me yeah and it's only the first day heck yeah. no yeah it's also a bro moment after that whenever you know they're all continuing their march and they make private pile walk <laughs> with his pants down and his and his thumb in his mouth yeah you know it's just one of those things it's like they're just trying to humiliate him and break him down um and, and you know to the point where they can mold him yeah but, yeah you guys got any bro moments so i do so we actually talked about most of them so i'm gonna this one might be going it's in when they're in vietnam so i don't know if you have anything before that just because the other bro moments that i had were when they beat the crap out of him with the soap mm. um he's so i talked about when he was in the head pile yeah um i wrote it down that he was low-key like scary and you can tell how broken he is yeah just um because they they mentally broke him there, mm-hmm. and he finally reached that point where he couldn't take it anymore. Yeah, and that's so scary to see as an audience because I can only imagine some people who actually go through that. Yeah, yeah, and most it, definitely. So that I had put that down, so we talked about it. But then my next one is when the journalists are meet that new people in that little hut, and they're like, "Oh, this is my brother." Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, that's one of my bro moments as well. Yeah, that's that's a hard to watch scene. It is, it is, and and they lift up the hat, and you you assume it's one of the sol- soldiers asleep. Mm-hmm. That's what I thought at least first watching this, and you, they lift up the hat from it, and it's an enemy who's dead. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, they're just make, making fun of him. Like that's yeah. a human. Like yeah. yes, it's your enemy in a way, but it's still a human. Yeah. Like let him be in peace. Let him be with his family at least or something yeah and me give him you know a proper burial or exactly something like it just goes to show that these guys have been fully dehumanized exactly they they, they have no regard for human life at that point and, yeah you know are trying to poke fun at someone that they just killed and now they're like oh yeah take a picture with me with them you yeah. know and he's like yeah that's a dead person bro yeah like uh-huh. wild it, it and it kind of like I, and I put it down because it upset me because, like I said, why don't they just let them be at peace? Let them – you did what you had to do. You did your job, mm-hmm. whatever. Like, I don't care about – but it's still a human. Yeah. You killed a human. Let them be in peace. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. Yeah, and I, I, I think this entire movie, they, they do they do a lot of things very effectively because, you know – that that triggers a human response in us, right? Like that's that's a that person deserves respect. You yeah, know, they just yeah. they they passed away. They need to be treated with respect, um, and that that triggers something you know innately human in all of us. Um, or at least and it I, should, yeah. yeah, and I I, I appreciate it in that in that aspect because this movie is doing something effectively. You know, um, trying it's trying to get the point across that like you know this stuff should not be happening, yeah. right? Like war, you know, war serves its purposes, but to what extent? And 
you know, at what cost? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this movie at the end of it gets you to question that and, you know, ask yourself those questions. And um, I really appreciate it in that, in that aspect. Um, but I do have a bro moment uh, before whenever they're on Paris Island. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the whole, this is my rifle scene. When, when we, when we get them, you know, getting in bed and they're with the rifles and they're doing the, this is my rifle. Yeah. There are many like it, but this one is mine. They do this whole thing. Um, I don't know. It just felt like cultish. Yeah. Almost. The military in general seems like a cult. Yeah. Like it, it felt cultish. Like, you know, they're like, you know, reciting memory verses. Yeah. And like all that stuff, you know, and it just, it felt like all of them were slowly being brainwashed into these, you know, killers and they're, they're having everything about them stripped away from them and they're slowly becoming these things that the drill instructor is making them out to be. Mm-hmm. But yeah. yeah. You got a, you got any bro moments, Nick? The only one I had uh, that we haven't talked about again is the scene where we could see the bodies covered in that like lime powder. Yeah. I think that was just like soup. It was really gruesome to see that and kind of just brought a little bit more of like a reality of war and seeing just all these bodies just hanging out in the ditch. Yeah. Another pretty, one. Pretty harrowing. Yeah. yeah. Another one that I have that I thought was like dumb um, was when they straight up bring um, someone to do services with them in the middle of a war. Yeah. Yeah. Like, are you that desperate? To be with someone that you they have you have to get someone to bring it in literally where yeah. you can die yeah i also hate how they like barter yeah with her and like try to she tries to say like oh no 15 dollars and they're like oh no five yeah and they're like uh well no, and 15 like, it's like no five we'll do five each of us five bucks yeah and then they talk them down to 10 and they're like no we're not gonna do it unless it's five dollars and she's like okay five dollars i guess yeah it is pretty funny whenever uh uh, is it eight ball? I forget exactly. I forget the guy that goes up to uh, to the woman and says like, "Okay, you know, I'll take it. Here's five bucks." And um, she's like, "No, like, I don't want to do it with him. He's too big." <laughs> yeah, it is, it is eight ball. Yeah, and uh, he's just like, "Oh, like, what do you mean? What do you mean it's too big?" You know, and she's just like, "No, oh, I don't want to do it. You know, <laughs> too big." And um, it's also kind of gross at this point too because like. Homie just, just, homie just whips it out. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, no, it ain't too big. And it's yeah. like real nasty. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, yeah, it's it's one of those things where it's like it's supposed to be funny, but then it gets really weird. And well, like, I, and I didn't even li- like – that's a funny part that you bring up. But the whole thing, again, like I said, is you're so desperate that you got to bring someone in. Yeah, it, and it, I mean that, that scene I think is added in there just to go to show that like these guys have – no no care that no care no yeah. there's no morality anymore yeah. it's all been stripped away you know now they're they are these machines that that have been crafted by by you know the military complex yeah, yeah. there's nothing human about them anymore they just have these strict you know almost you know animalistic type you know needs yeah and they're gonna do anything they can to like satisfy those yeah. unfortunately yeah, yeah. but that truth yeah you guys got any more bro moments after that no the last one was finding out seeing the teenage girl for me okay yeah that was my last one as well yeah okay um i think we had we talked about um homie shooting those rice farmers from the helicopter yeah, that, yeah. that's a huge bro moment um that guy just blows my mind that he's just killing civilians like they're literally on the way to drop these two off on their assignment for, you know, their journalism that they're doing. And like, he doesn't need to kill anyone, but he's just unloading on people like from the helicopter. And then, you know, we get this whole thing of him being like a joker asking like, you know, how do you kill women and children? And he comes up with this bull crap excuse of like, Oh, you know, they're all trying to kill us. I might as well kill them all first. You know, like that's, and he's just laughing when he's doing it. Like, disgusting behavior and yeah. like you can tell like he's been you know th- there's a line in the movie where they said like once you've been in the crap you know you know that's when you know you've like seen war you can tell this man has been you know fully brainwashed or, or in the crap yeah um for however long so all right well let's get into um some facts with the bros yeah. so Maybe you want to start us yeah so i'll start and it 
with the budget and from what I see it took 30 million to make this movie which is a lot it's for 1987 bit. yeah it's quite or, a bit for the 80s and wow. so opening weekend they made 2.2 million um, gross in Canada and US it made 46.3 million and worldwide it says the same 46.3 which I don't know mm. if it's true just cause I was you would think worldwide would produce more money. Yeah. Um, but that's what I got for the budget. So it wasn't a flop. Yeah. But it, I mean, yeah, it made its money back, but it, it also 16 it, million more. Yeah. I mean, and which I guess is a substantial more, you know, substantially more amount, or whatever I'm trying to say. Um, you know, it's a, it's a bigger amount than what they, you know, put in, but it's also like not that big of a difference. No, you know? no, not at all. <laughs> but, um, essentially it's just a half. Yeah, almost. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. All right, well, um, another one of the facts that I have, which I find very interesting, is this movie was Oscar-nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay mm. in its year. Um, yes. Which, you know, it definitely earns that uh, that merit. I mean, this movie has awesome writing. Yeah. So they could definitely deserve that nomination for sure. Um, I have another one here. In regards to uh, the first part of the movie, in regard, you know, when I, and when I say the first part of the movie, I'm talking about like uh, the boot camp scene or Paris Island. Um, so in that uh, that first part of the movie, the sequences inside the barracks during the drills and all that stuff, there was a special lens that was designed to keep every recruit in focus. Um, mm. Ku- Kubrick had intended that no one was, you know, uh, special or mm-hmm. you know had any sort of special treatment, and that they all had the same. Um, exact outcome and exact same treatment. So mm. we wanted everyone to be in focus and have this specific look to those um, those drill sergeant scenes. Mm. I thought that was cool. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Nick? I have a fact here I thought was really interesting. Um, so when we talk about the scene where the sniper little girl gets shot, um, you know, Private Joker goes up and is, he says... Oh, she's praying because we get to hear these words coming out. But a fact to have here is that she's actually saying so much pain in Vietnamese, which is why she ple- uh, pleaded to be shot. Oh shoot! Oh wow! Again, see, yeah. that's what I'm saying. So she wasn't she wasn't praying or whatever. She was saying so much pain, and then that's when she started saying, "You know, shoot, shoot me, me, shoot me." Yeah, it's that sad. also just goes to show, like this, you know, in in regards to the screenplay, like these dumb Americans. Like trying to make it like, oh man, she's probably like, you know, trying to make it seem like it's like beautiful. Like she's like praying, like she's trying to make, you know, peace, peace. or something like that. Yeah. But literally, she's just like, kill me. I like, want to die. Like that's. Yeah. I'm done. Like that's hard. Yeah. That's hard to hard to hear. <laughs> well, hold on. There's an actual extra scene that was supposed to make it in the in the movie, and it's a little bit more gruesome. Let me read Oh, I think you. he took mine. <laughs> After Joker killed the sniper, Animal Mother would bring out his machete to chop off the sniper's head and throw it out the window. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was cut obvious for obvious reasons, but I couldn't imagine seeing that on film. No, most definitely. Hmm. That's that, crazy. The, the movie would have taken Made a while. It, to, like, it was even pretty wild like up to that point, but it yeah. would have been took like took a dive. Like uh, after yeah. that, it would have been. It would have well, really dr- driven home the fact that like these guys truly have no humanity. You know, there's no, there's nothing human about them anymore. They they've yeah. been turned into these machines. Yeah. What's the rating after R? Uh, I think there's NC seventeen. Yeah, I feel like if they did something like that, it'd be in that category. Yeah. Um. Or just straight up like almost like a snuff film. Yeah. Where, like, <laughs> like where people like straight up like truly die and it's filmed i can't imagine <laughs> no um one fact that i have so vincent diono frio who plays oh, frio, yeah um mm. pile yeah um so he actually tore ligaments in his knee on the ox- ox- <laughs> obstacle course due to how much weight extra weight he had to put on for that yeah, I had read something too that like he he put on like almost seventy pounds. Yeah, so he, that's not like the weight he was at when he started. Yeah, which is crazy because when I see Private Pile, I'd be like, oh yeah, that's what that guy looks like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but he like truly like changed his entire look and everything to. Look I think that it way. was 
74 pounds that he put on. That's crazy. Um, and yeah, so he, during the obstacle course, he tore ligaments in his knee. Because, I mean, just imagine, you're so used to the certain weight. Mm-hmm. And then you do something and then, like, you're messed up. <laughs> yeah, I had read something, too, that um, the guy that plays the drill sergeant, um, R. Lee Ermey, he got injured on filming too as well. He had like gotten in a car accident oh, and like shoot. broke a ton of ribs or something. And like there are certain scenes where like he won't move his left arm much because he like that whole side, like he had a c- couple of broken ribs. That's crazy. Cause the thing about ribs too, is you can't do much about them. Nope. Once they're broken, they just take their own time to heal. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. I, um, I got a pretty, pretty good one in here actually about the drill sergeant. Um, which I find very interesting. And this has been one of those things where, you know, when people think of Full Metal Jacket, anyone that knows any trivia about it is like, oh, it's so crazy. You know, Drill Sergeant had no lines, you know, all ad-libbed and stuff. Um, So I'll break it down a little bit here because I thought this was very interesting. So director Stanley Kubrick had nothing but praise for R. Lee Ermey's skills as a performer. Mm. Uh, Kubrick originally was going to write dialogue for Ermey's character himself, but he became so impressed with what Ermey had improvised that he decided it was not necessary. Um, so he would simply let um, Ermey ad-lib and act practically unheard of, which is, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's unheard of for a Stanley Kubrick film. Like, mm-hmm. Stanley Kubrick is a guy who is rigid and wants things to go the way he wants. And yeah, so yeah. hearing this, you know, this man letting him just have free reign, do whatever he wants is pretty wild. Um, but yeah, so Ermi's performances were so faultless that Kubrick would only need like two or three takes to get his scenes filmed, which is also another crazy thing and is extremely rare for a Kubrick film because he is known for his like... Professionality. You know, you know per- yeah, like... Perfection. Uh, yeah, his professional, you know, everything has to be perfect and, you know, numerous takes. Like he yeah. would film multiple, multiple takes. Um the only instance where Ermi had to film more than two or three takes was the jelly donut scene, which he claimed was filmed in 37 takes Dang. Oh to the point. God. Yeah. To the point where Ermi's voice would keep, uh, would keep disappearing from time to time because he would just yell so much. That's wild. Yeah. Pretty crazy. But the yeah, last one was pretty interesting. Yeah. The last one that I got, it's kind of like gruesome and I'm glad it's not in this film. Um, so there was a scene that was cut from the movie and it showed a group of Marines playing soccer. Um, the scene was actually cut because later in it shows that it was actually a head instead of a soccer ball. Oh, oh my gosh. Jeez, dude. <laughs> yeah, that, that would have been pretty wild. That would have been very Playing soccer wild. With, a, with a cut off head, man. That's, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, again, would have driven home that, that point of inhumane you know yeah lost all respect lost loss of all innocence yeah you know? yeah crazy but that's all i have for fact okay i got a couple big ones here which i'm gonna read off and uh let you guys soak it in yeah or or react to them um so in order to make uh this the drill instructor's performance and the recruits reactions uh, as convincing as possible excuse me um, Matthew Modine, who plays Joker, and Vincent Dionfrio, who plays Pyle, and the other actors uh, who play the recruits never met R. Lee Ermey in, uh, before filming. Uh, Stanley Kubrick also saw to it that Ermey never hung out with the actors between takes to drive home that, uh, that point of, like, he's, you know, only the he's, drill sergeant. he's only the drill sergeant, he's not your friend, Dang. and all this stuff. So that was pretty interesting. Um, another one here in in Matthew Modine's memoir, um, he recalled a day where he asked Stanley Kubrick's permission to leave the set because his pregnant wife was scheduled to have a C-section, and he didn't have any scenes planned for that day. Kubrick didn't want him to leave the set, claiming that he would just pass out from the blood and get in the way of the doctors. It wasn't until Modine threatened to cut his own hand in order to get to the hospital that Kubrick relented and allowed him to leave by making him promise to come back immediately after it was done. Jeez. Honestly. That's wild. That's. Like, to, like he, he almost didn't want him to see, like, the birth of his own child. <laughs> I would hate that. Like, that's a once, in, not in a once a lifetime team, but that's a precious moment. Yeah. It's crazy. Honestly, I don't like Kubrick for that. <laughs> yeah. He, he was a wild guy, for sure. Um, here's another crazy one. 
Denzel Washington was considered for the role of 8-Ball, but he declined because he couldn't read the script before auditioning. He has since said that it is a role that he regrets missing out on. Wow. Which I thought was pretty wild. Yeah. Um, another one here. After the sniper... Oh, yeah. No, you said that one, Nick. Um, this is my last one here. That bathroom mop scene between Joker and Cowboy mm-hmm. seems fairly simple. Right? Yeah. That scene alone took 62 takes to complete. Bro, them just, why? Them just, just mopping? mopping? Yeah, them just mopping. However, Cowboy's death scene took only five. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tell me how you can perfect <laughs> the death dude. scene. Yeah, you can perfect the death scene in five but takes. Not but not mopping. The mopping, you're but just like, mopping. another one, another one, another one, you know. I'd be so tired of mopping. Yeah, I thought that was pretty funny. Right, bro, let's just get out of here. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was pretty funny, but that's about does it, that about does it for the facts for me. Mm. Yeah, you guys got any more? Up. No, I do not. Okay. All right. Well, let's get into what didn't work. Mm. The first thing that I put, and I may get crap for this, and I may you may disagree with me, but this movie is too slow for my liking. Mm. Um, I got there was parts, um, and I can specifically think of of Vietnam when they're in Vietnam, where. I'm a little bored, and I'm just like, okay, what's going to happen? Like, can something happen already? Yeah. Um, And I was just like, okay, like, let's get over with it. So I think for that, I didn't like it too much, and it kind of – and you might hate, hate me for this, and I, and I kind of relate it to The Shining, where The Shining is too slow. Mm. Um, And I think that's maybe something that Kubrick does is just make slow movies. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Um. I think like out of these two and A Clockwork Orange, which I haven't seen in a, in a while, um, I don't know if his style is just slow movies. Mm-hmm. Um, because this movie is only about like you know close to two hours. It's not yeah, like it's exactly two hours. Fifty-six. Yeah, it's it's close to two hours long, and I, I think it just gets slow. This is my what didn't work. It gets slow in the second half whenever yeah, they yeah. get to Vietnam, and I think that's because we no longer have the drill sergeant. Mm-hmm the drill sergeant and the entire boot camp sequence makes this film fly by. Um, yeah. and, it's, and it's because we get, we get to care for these characters and it's funny in some points. And it's also, you know, dark and, uh, and scary at some points. Um, and I, and I, it's honestly like when I watch this film, I really watch it for that first half. Yeah. Um, but coming back to it again, I, I can understand like where the, the love for the second half is as well, because, um, you know, it also shows that uh, that change in, in Joker. Um, Joker, you know, originally doesn't change much in the first half of the film. It takes it takes him being in war, uh, you know, to fully transition into into what he was molded to be. Yeah. Um, so I think that's that's really interesting in, in reference to the second part. But it does move a little slower than the first half. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, yeah, that's that's something that didn't work for me. Unf- and you know. Un- I guess I should say, fortunately, the only thing that didn't work for me. Yeah. But. Yeah, I will say some of the ways that Stanley Kubrick decides to build tension, for me, feels a little, like, drawn out. And the scene I'm thinking of specifically is when he is about to shoot that, that little girl. And it's a really harrowing scene, too, but, like, I feel like it drags on for a couple seconds longer than it needs to. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think he does that, too, with, like... um. Like like certain scenes where like you can see Private Pile, um, slowly like going into madness. Yeah. Like he he leaves those shots on there for a long periods of time. Yeah, and sometimes I'm I'm kind of like, well, I already kind of know what's happening. Like, just can you just get it over with, please? You know what I mean? Like the tension in those scenes, it's really high, but since it's held too long, it tapers off super quickly. And I'm like, okay, I'm no longer interested. I just want to see the rest of what he has to offer. You know. Okay. Yeah, I get that. That's understandable. Yeah. Yeah, and in regards to the second half of the movie, to me it felt a little bit um, not as structured. I kind of wanted, wanted it to be a little bit more structured, but I felt like it was really freeform with how we follow these characters, and we were kind of just, I don't know, it seemed like there was no destination. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like that we were just following the character kind of going through the motions, and I, I, I really craved some of that, that order that we had in the first half. Hmm. But yeah. I, I can kind of, and we'll get to 
I can dive more into it why a part of it of why it did work. Mm. Um, but I understand why it had to be like that. Yeah. Another thing that I did put was this movie can be two movies. And and I think about that as saying the whole first part of Paris Island that can be preparing for war. Like that could just be a movie just about this is what you have to go through to prepare for war. This is what you're going to what we have to do to you to prepare you again. Um and then the whole part of Vietnam could be a different movie being this is what you're going to go through in war. Um and I think that's something that I didn't I'm just like all right, I could have paused it right there and be like, all right, like they graduated, they know what to they know how to fight now. They know they have that mentality of a soldier, soldier excuse me. And like that and I'm okay with it to end it there. Mm. Like um and then I can and I can watch the second part in Vietnam a different time and then be like, "Oh, this is what you're going to expect them more." Okay. Um so I didn't like that just cuz it wasn't for me I wish I saw them leaving Paris Island and getting to Vietnam like where they're going like we don't get nothing we just get straight into Vietnam yeah um and that's something that I don't like a lot okay yeah I think um I think just in talking about that as well I think for me this movie isn't terribly rewatchable um yeah and in the fact that like the only time I think I would ever really want to rewatch this is for the boot camp scenes (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> like because because of how funny they can be and and also like you know how um intense some of the parts can be like i think specifically of whenever private piles in the bathroom um or or um whenever he's getting beat up you know like there there are certain scenes where like i could go back to that and be like man like that's a crazy scene or that's a good yeah. one you know um and, and i think that's a, a a shortfall for this movie because you have such a good first half and then the second half kind of you know, gets a little slower or becomes a little bit more methodical Mm -hmm. um, and kind of loses your audience in the process of doing so. Yeah. Um, Or at least some of them. So I think that's a a little bit what's wrong. Yeah. And I, and I, I could, I'm going to piggyback off you. And my last one was, I don't think I had, I would rewatch this movie for those reasons. Yeah. I could see myself rewatching it, but it's, it doesn't have the same rewatchability. Um, that a lot of my other favorite picks do have exactly yeah but all right well if that's it for what didn't work let's get into what did work i have to say i immediately i i noticed a lot of the camera work in this movie um i really loved how beautiful some of the shots are amidst like all the chaos and destruction that happens in this film Mm -hmm. um it just goes to show that stanley kubrick is like a master at works in he's a master at work in terms of visual storytelling um I also just love some of the way that some of the shots were handled. Like I love, there's a huge long um, handheld uh, camera scene where the camera is just like following all these guys as they're going into Hue, and it looks so sick. And I, you can tell awesome. like it, yeah, you can tell it's handheld and it looks like he's holding it at like a lower angle. Yeah, and it's just walking like uh, along all these guys. It looks so cool. There's a scene exactly like that, real quick. That um, when they're going into the building where the sniper is, when they throw the smoke, yeah, um, that scene is so sick too. And that's what, and I was gonna bring that up. That's something that I did like was the camera work. So I thank you for bringing it up. Is I think that would have to be one of my favorite stills. Did you see like six or seven soldiers there with the smoke on one side and then just chaos on the other side? Yeah, and it's and I and it's low. Like they're they're probably knee high yeah. where the camera is at. And I'm yeah. just like, dude, that's so cool. Yeah, there's another really cool shot um, whenever Animal Mother is storming, Mm -hmm. you know, over there to try to save 8-Ball and that other guy. Um, It does this super cool focus shift where, like, the camera is focused on Animal Mother on the wall. And then whenever he goes to peek out and look over at the, uh, the place where the sniper is shooting from, the focus shifts to that building. And you just see the building in focus and he's out of focus and... I don't know when I was watching it I was just like dude that's so cool like the way that they you know shift focus Mm -hmm. between the two objects it was done really well and um, Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that aspect of it yeah and for for this being an 87 film this is amazing it's amazing yeah the colors that they put in it like for military so to say um, like the browns and the the greens and it's they're they're popping like I hate to say it like they're 
they're popping but it's like they're super vibrant and it feels like this is a movie that was taped today to make it look a little bit old old yeah that's actually um that brings up a fact i had saw um when doing a little bit of research about this film this this was one of kubrick's first films that he edited on a computer oh dang yeah he didn't he didn't um actually edit this like a linearly linearly i think that's how you say it yeah yeah you said it right um he doesn't edit this the way it's shot on film and you know cut certain snippets of film out paste them together and all that stuff he did this this uh the editing for this film on a computer which pretty pretty crazy it worked it worked pretty good yeah yeah another thing I, i liked about this movie was the the effects i thought they were really convincing when it comes to like those bullets or like someone getting shot yeah i was like that's it's gruesome it sounds it real looks, it looks real yeah yeah no, I, I appreciated the the effects of this yeah i also enjoy just how candid and real this movie feels yeah i go ahead go ahead i'll add to it after yeah i, I just to uh, i guess try to to unpack that a little bit more this movie feels like it's taking place in real time yeah like it's it feels like you know someone is just documenting this stuff it's not you know fully scripted out and i think that comes from the lack of structure like nick was talking about um i think that that style lends it to feeling more real mm-hmm. if, if that makes sense mm-hmm. i guess but. what i want to say is i like this movie because of the emotions it gets me to think like i i'm like how can my the emotions that i have is i'm angry I get sad, I get frustrated, and I'm like, how how can someone do that? And then, especially the scene where they have the dead enemy. Like, how, how can someone have that there? And then you get a little funny scene, and then you get... So the emotions that it gave me, I can appreciate this movie, because there's not a lot of war movies that will give you that kind of emotion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's another thing I could say I really enjoy about this film, is it makes you answer those questions. Mm-hmm. It makes you come up to, come to your own conclusion about how you feel about a certain yeah. subject like war. Yeah. Um, which I think is important. I think it's an important conversation for many people to have. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that it made you think that way. Yeah. It's so. yeah. So that's yeah. about it for me though. Okay. Um, I have to say awesome performances in this, especially from R. Lee Ermey as the drill instructor. Mm-hmm. It's, um, yeah, man, his performance is just out of this world. Like he, I think he earned a, um, a golden globe for it i believe but, but man he, I mean, he golden kills globes it aren't that big but yeah, yeah. He, he but he kills it in this movie yeah like he i i really enjoy his performance as well as um D, dion frio um who plays private pile like yeah. they, they they really do kill it in this movie so nick do you, you have anything, anything else nick? no i was just gonna uh highlight the characters and you know they're not too too stand out ish, but you know what they do provide in terms of you know a character you can root for. I think they they did a pretty good job. Like when it came to you know seeing Cowboy dying, he wasn't just this character I knew nothing about. I had no connection to. I actually felt something for him. So I think that's a testament to just how he he wrote some of these characters. And you know they they don't really have a lot of room to 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 carve their own into this movie. You know it's more about them being a machine in the system, but I think for what they did, especially in the second half, they they really kind of gave them their own little characteristics, which I appreciated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that too. I think that also I'll kind of piggyback off you a little bit, Nick, and in the in the effect that I I really enjoy the writing for this film. Um, I, I I believe I'd said that already, but um, the writing is great in this, and I I really enjoy um, uh, Stanley Kubrick like taking this source material from the novel and adapting it to to film and um i also just really appreciate his direction as well you can tell that he's a very good director and yeah. knows what he wants in the end and you know can, can visualize a uh, a film you know uh, an end goal uh, a product and he is able to execute those ideas and yeah. execute that that movie that he has in mind and yeah. um I, think, I, I really appreciate that about him. Yeah, I guess so to say he once he, he sets his mind to something, he is going to accomplish it. Um, and that's something that we talked about in The Shining as well. He set his mind for a certain way The Shining was going to be, and he accomplished it. He set yeah. his mind for this one, and he accomplished this one as well. So I guess, yeah, that's something that he does really well. 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's about it for what did work for me as well. So if that's it, um, let's move into who wins the movie. Mm. Um, this might be a little controversial <laughs> take, but honestly for me, I mean, we're, we're led to believe that our main character throughout the film is Joker. Yeah. Um, but to me, who wins the movie is Arlie Ermey, who plays the drill instructor. Yeah. Or Vincent. Really? Yeah. Or Vincent Dion Frio, who plays Private Pyle. I think I like. I chose um, Arlie Ermey just just because he, the way he per- portrays the drill sergeant or drill instructor was amazing. Just because, and he was one. Yeah. So it it's, it shows what he was and how he can do it. Um, and I just wish he was in the whole movie. Yeah. Um, so I think for that he wins the movie for me. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm gonna have to go with Private Pile of uh, Vincent Zanofrio just because he was like the driving factor of that first half, and I think the first half is what killed it for me. So I gotta, I gotta give it to him on mm. this one. Okay. And, no, and that's respectable. Yeah, most definitely. So let's get into themes then. Um, I had kind of given away my theme like in the beginning of the episode, I think, but. My theme I'd written down here is uh, this movie is a distressing critique on the military mindset and Vietnam in general. Hmm. Um, and just, you know, the, it, you know, it tackles the, the, the questions of, you know, the time that, you know, when Vietnam was having, like, why are we there? What, why does America need to be involved in this war? Um, and also, you know, a critique to, towards the military mindset and the effect that, like, you know, why do we feel the need to break these people down? What's the purpose of all of this? What's the purpose of war? You know, and it, it, it makes you ask all of those questions. And I feel like at the end of it, it kind of does it in like a, almost like a satire way or, mm-hmm. um, you know, just kind of like a critique way and makes someone question at the end of the film, um, you know, their beliefs on that certain subject, yeah. which I think it does effectively. So, mm-hmm. uh, this is kind of, it was hard for me to write down the theme just cause I kind of struggled with this movie. Um, but I think one that I can immediately think of is your a lifestyle can change you me- mentally. Mm. Um, because I mean, military is a lifestyle. You're gonna go into that, and then you're gonna carry on that for the for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, and that's a, a to me, I kind of think it's a burden because you are dealing with so much heavy things. Mm-hmm. Um, and we see that with uh, Private Pile. Um, that changed him bad, and I think it's just you got to be mentally prepared for it. So I just, I don't know. I guess I would say just be, be ready for the worst. Okay. I don't know. I don't know how to put that. Okay. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, other than you know, the dehumanization that war and that mentality brings on like that system, uh, I just think that like war breeds violence, mm-hmm. <laughs> like unnecessary amounts of violence. You know, like even it even in the most like g- gentle of people i think just being in that situation breeds uh, a violence unlike any in any like normal situation you know yeah and i yeah. i mean it's even highlighted with that little girl mm-hmm. just can't imagine any other situation you'd see a like a 12 year old girl being a, a, a sniper you know yeah this kind of violence and hatred that it, it, it uh, instills in you mm-hmm yeah, I like that. It's a good take. Yeah. All right. Well, if that's it for the themes. What are we rating this? I'll, I'm giving this one an eight. I think it's a good film. Um, it, it you know it it takes off a little bit for me because you know I really only will would watch it for that first half and it's not terribly rewatchable for me. Um, but nonetheless, I do think it's a good film. I think it has great things that go for it. You know. And I, I think it's a, a, another, you know, notch in Kubrick's belt, but personally not my favorite. Yeah. So. I gave this a six. Okay. Um, wasn't my favorite. Wasn't, there's the things that I liked about it. Um, and I, I think it's okay if you don't watch this movie. Um, mm-hmm. there's, there really isn't a need for it, I, so to say. Um, and for that, I give it a six. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to give this one kind of in the middle of you guys a seven. Kind of for the same reasons as you, Isaiah. It wasn't really my favorite, but I recognize all of the great stuff that it brought on the table. And, you know, I know a lot of people love it, but it just kind of wasn't one of my favorites. Hmm. Okay. So, a seven, but, yeah, it's still good. It still has a lot of really good redeeming qualities. All right. All right. 
All right, y'all. Well, that's how we feel about <laughs> uh, Full Metal Jacket. So uh, this is the end of the episode. So if you made it all the way to the end, thank you very much. We do appreciate it. Um, as always, I mean, you know, get in contact with us in every episode description. Um, we leave all of our socials down there as well as our methods of contact, you know, via email. Um, so if you want to get in contact with us or anything like that, go to the descriptions of every episode and follow us on our social media platforms or letterboxed and try to get in contact with us that way. Another way you can get in contact with us or try to get us to see, um, you you know, your thoughts and everything like that is through a rate and review. Um, you can do that by going to, you know, Apple podcasts or Spotify. Um, I don't know if Spotify does rate and reviewing, but, um, the rate and reviews really do help. Um, they let us know exactly what it is that you're loving or not liking about the episodes or the podcast, what we can do to help or what we can do to fix it, um, how we can improve. I mean, you know, we want to we want to continue to make this better for everyone listening. So uh, if you can do that for us, that would be great. And then um, we also, like we said, are posting these episodes now on YouTube. We do have video now. Yeah. Um, so follow us on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to our channel, like our videos, let like in the videos lets us know that you're liking what we're doing. Um, leave comments, share it, turn your bell notification on. What other <laughs> whistles and bells do I need to take in order to be a YouTuber? Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, so if you want to, you know, video podcasts are more your style, go check us out on YouTube. Um, our YouTube link uh, to the channel is also in our episode descriptions as well. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah. Um, whose pick is it next week? It is my pick. And actually, I'm really excited about this because I've been wanting to watch this movie for a while. Um, and I'm choosing the 2012 film End of Watch. Um, and it is with Jake Gyllenhaal and Mike, Michael Pena. Okay. And, um, but I got the van, though. Yeah. Michael Pena. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it's it's uh, not streaming anywhere, unfortunately. I think it's on, like, stars. Stars, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. I'm choosing the movie End of Watch. Yeah, we're not a stars podcast over here. We're HBO. HBO Max only. <laughs> sounds, it honestly sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, Dude, we're I'm gonna excited be... though. I love this movie so much. I'm gonna be honest. I haven't watched it. You've never seen it? No. Oh, oh so gosh. This will, this will be my first watch. So. Um, it's a. It's a. Ah, shoot. If we're we're talking about like sad movie on with what we just watched, just wait till this one. It's kind of this one really gets the stake and stabs it in your heart, man. All right. It makes me cry. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's just because he's your man, though. So. Yeah, I love Jake. Too, huh? <laughs> all right. Well, um, all right. If that's it for the episode, um, as always, this has been the Film Bros Podcast. Thank you all, and good night. Good night. Good night.